Where's the music? Hang on. There we go. Coming to you live from the top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52, just outside of Failsbad, Pakistan. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am, I'm alive. And I still have my soul intact. My soul is still in my body because someone said, Gesundheit, God bless you. I have been sneezing my head off. The air around me, I'm allergic to air, apparently. I'm allergic to oxygen atoms uh, for some reason. Uh, I can always tell when, when, uh, when nature says spring is here in spite of the calendar in spite of the vernal equinox in spite of uh, little bunnies and lambs and everything else my body knows at least here in the state of missouri when spring has arrived about 10 years ago i've never been i've never been allergic to anything in all my except for penicillin i can't take penicillin but i've never really been allergic to airborne things all of my life until about I don't know 10 12 years ago something like that and all of a sudden springtime hit and my, I just sneeze uncontrollably um, my eyes would burn and itch I mean so bad I would just I would just walk around like this going Ugh. people would say what are you mad about I'm not mad I'm miserable and then the inside of my lips would itch. And when I say the inside of my lips, I don't mean this part right here. I mean inside of my lips would itch. I'd like to take a fork and jab it up in between the skins of my lip and just run it around and scratch it in there. Can't do that. But that's what I would like to. And so yesterday it hit full force. And by the time I got home, I was miserable, sneezing. And I'm not just talking about, it's you, it's you. When I sneeze, it's like anything else I do. It's very loud. And my wife said, what are you hollering about? I said, honey, it was a sneeze. And I took a lot of Benadryl yesterday, a, a lot of it, just to get it under control. And so my wife, as smart as she is, I get ready to go to work this morning, and I'm Achha! like that. And she goes, here, take this. That little, little bitty tablet. And I go, what is this? She said, it's Claritin, take it. And uh, I'll have you know that I'm not, I didn't know who makes this stuff. I'm not getting paid. This is not an endorsement. This is not anything else other than my wife gave me this little bitty pill, and I have been virtually sneeze-free, which is good, because I just recorded the uh, part four. Is it part four? Yeah. I think it's part four. Anyway, um, another Jesus. And um, that part is done. It's in the can. Lindsay's going to start working on it this week, have it ready by uh, Sunday. And it's the last part of Another Jesus. Now I have to start working on Another Spirit, which is going to follow that. And um, very, very interesting thing that I found out yesterday. I found this out yesterday. And I'm going to be bringing that to you today during the broadcast. And, and absolutely, you're, you're going to die when you, well, you're not really going to die. You will be stunned and amazed when you see what I have to show you today concerning the Hebrew Roots Movement, and the Mark of the Beast. And this falls in line with another Jesus. So hang on to your seats. First thing I want to do, let me get my pieces of paper here. First thing I want to do is um, uh, we have a friend of our ministry, Joanne. I, I guess I can give her name because she gives it on the book, Joanne Cecil. And uh, she sent us, she, she, we called, and she's one of these New Jersey uh, gals, one of these new Joycey gals. She talks like this. I I probably just ruined it, but anyway, she's she's a fun to talk to. Uh, her and her husband, they love the Lord. They love uh, this ministry in our church, and they have been following us for a long time now. 
she told me about this, and and I asked her permission uh, to share it publicly, and she said she could as long as it helps. She wrote her testimony of having an abortion, and uh, the book is called uh, I Shall Go to Him. And, that, of course, that comes from what David said when uh, his firstborn son uh, had died, and this is her testimony of, of having an abortion. And um, she talks about how God uh, healed her through it, um, she misses her 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 child every day, and uh, and I and I like some of the we were, we actually worked on this and put some of the graphics in here. Let me see if I can get that lined up there. I like that picture. All right, I like that picture. Uh, but anyway, she sent me an article, and you can get this from our ministry for your love offering of absolutely nothing. Uh, we'll send you a copy of that book. It's called I Shall Go to Him. It's the testimony about the abortion that she had and how God brought her through it. And uh, we'll send that to you in case if you know somebody that's been through that uh, or somebody that's thinking about it, get them a copy of that book, all right? Um, they are free of charge, but they do cost us a little bit. I think something like that would probably cost us 2 or $3 to put together. That's not counting the labor and everything like that. So uh, maybe think about helping us out if you would, all right? Um, and here's her, her email says, uh, Pastor Mike, I'm sending you a link to a World Net Daily article regarding Planned Parenthood. It's about granting rights to kill a baby if the baby survives an abortion attempt. And I pulled it up. Uh, it, I think it's still there. If, yeah, it is still there. I'm looking at it. Uh, a lobbyist for a regional division of Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion business in the United States, says a doctor and a mother should be allowed to decide to kill a newborn who survives an abortion. Are you kidding me? There is something wrong with people who, even after the baby is born, that they decide that they should have the right to say, well, we were going to kill it. It would have been killed. It would have been dead had we not botched the abortion. Now that it's alive and breathing on its own, we're going to kill it. That's murder. That is at that 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 by the the abortion people's very definition is that if it's in the womb, it's tissue. Once it comes out, it's it's a human being. Every law in the country forbids the killing of a living, breathing human being. And now they want the Planned Parenthood started by um, what's her name? Yeah, started by her. Uh, Hillary Clinton's um, biggest idol, I can't, uh, Margaret Sanger, started Planned Parenthood. Why? Margaret Sanger hated black people, brown people, yellow people, red people, every other kind of people except white Caucasian Europeans. She hated them. She considered them mongrel races. You ought to read some of the stuff she wrote. This woman was pathetic. And Hillary Rodham Clinton models herself after Margaret. Oh, she's one of my heroes. I just love Margaret Sanger, which basically says, this is what Hillary says. I hate black people. I hate Jews. I hate Hispanics. I hate brown people, yellow people, red people, and brown and black people. I hate all of them because all they do is they get in their ghettos and they breed. And the whole purpose behind Planned Parenthood that Margaret Sanger started was a planned genocide of, of people of various races to kill them off, to put abortion clinics in their communities to thin out the population of blacks, browns, yellows, reds, and whatever. That was her purpose in it. That's the purpose of Planned Parenthood. And now they're just going to go up a notch with it. And if the child is actually born... They feel that they should have a right. And I, can, I'll, you, know what, you want me to tell you something? I think they're already doing it. I think Planned Parenthood is, and the abortion mills are already killing born babies that survived the botched abortion. They're not admitting it. And any admittance of it is going to get covered up. I think they're already doing it. I think they're doing it, and they now want the law to reflect the fact that they have been doing it and that they have a right to do it. They have a right to kill little innocent babies. I tell you Planned Parenthood, and I, and I, I doubt anybody's listening to me, from Planned Parenthood, the pro-abortion, and all of you folks who voted for pro-abortion candidates, 
Well, you need to understand, I'm a Democrat, and, and uh, you got guys got to have money in his pocket. That's the most important thing. We got to have money. We got to get uh, paid a fair wage, and the, and the Democrat Party, they're for the working man. I've heard that until it makes me absolutely sick. You vote for those, you put those guys in office that are, that are pro-queer, pro-sodomite marriage, pro-abortion. You have ruined this country with your political candidates who put, you sold out for money in your pockets what you did. You're a sellout. You're a traitor as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. But uh, these abortion people... They've got a judgment coming upon them. It's And no, I'm not going to blow up an abortion clinic. And no, I don't think you ought to go blow up an abortion clinic. That's stupid. You are not the arm of the Lord. Get that out of your head. God, if God said vengeance is mine, I'll repay. And I can tell you that every abortion doctor, every nurse, every person who has, who has uh, had an abortion and not been forgiven. See, God forgives. God forgives. And that's the whole purpose of Joe's testimony. God forgives, and he heals. But you, if you had an abortion, you just killed a, you killed a human being. You offered, now don't you listen to this, you offered your child on the altar of Molech. Why? So that you would have a better life. That's why they did it in the Old Testament. They felt that if they, they offered their child to Molech on the altar, that the God would give them a better life somehow, some way. And this is what you did. Why did you get an abortion? Well, you don't understand, Pastor. She was only 15 years old when she got pregnant, and she had her whole life ahead of her. And she, my goodness, she would have been raising that in high school, not being able to go to college, and on and by sides that, that boyfriend was a bum, and, and you just don't understand. We had to kill that baby. Make you Listen, you make me sick. When you justify the death of an innocent human being for your own selfish whims and needs, you make me absolutely sick. There's something wrong with you. No, that's not the Claritin talking either. Um, get, get a copy of this and um, share it with people. Uh, you know what we ought to do? We ought to come up with some way of putting this PDF online where people can download it. I don't know how to do that. If you've got any suggestions, I'd like to hear it. Uh, send me an email. Pa uh, let's see here. Pastor Mike at kingjamescode.org or kingjamescode at gmail.com. Uh, send me an email. Now, I do want to tell you, I'm going out of town Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And if you've got emails to send, if you, if you, want, to, if you want to make orders, do that. That's fine. But I'm telling you that for three or four days, nobody is going to be around here. And I mean nobody is going to be around here to answer your email. Uh, we're going to Harrison, Arkansas, Thursday. And uh, Gary, Kay, Alicia, Rose, me, Brady, Amanda, Caleb, uh, we're all headed south. And I'm, I'm telling you that you're going to hear the sound of crickets and tumbleweeds in the parking lot for the next three or four days. Uh, and so it, whatever emails you send, there's a good chance they won't even, that we won't even be able to see it. And the reason why is we get so many of them in a day that once they're about three days old, they're nearly impossible to catch back up on. So I'm announcing this now. Hold off. Hold off on the emails. Uh, if it's orders or whatever, just wait until we get back, and then we'll resume. But, but this, is a, this is a good trip. It's a way that I can get our people down and hear some, hear some good preaching for a change. And um, I, I need to get preached at is what I need. And so anyway, um, just, just be praying for us for our trip, all right? Uh, what else is going on in the world? Uh, Big Sis, Janet Napolitano. Uh, Janet Napolitano has ignored a letter. She's uh, the head of the Department of uh, Homeland Insecurity. Written by New Jersey Congressman Leonard Lance, calling for the Department of Homeland Insecurity. A chief to attend a congressional briefing and provide an explanation as to why the DHS has committed to purchasing more than 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition over the last year. In other words, they just want to sit her down and say, uh, Ms. Napolitano, why are you buying so many bullets? Well, we just feel like, but they, she won't even do that. Lance, who first promised to investigate the matter during a Tea Party event March 15th, sent a letter five days later noting how there was a, quote, growing public concern surrounding the department's procurement of ammunition. 
He is not asking for Napolitano to testify, but to give us a congressional briefing because Congress wasn't aware of it. It deserves an answer. Over a week after the letter was sent, Lance's office has still not received a response, similar to how 15 other members of Congress <coughs> excuse me, were stonewalled by the Department of Homeland Insecurity when they demanded to know if the huge bullet purchases were an attempt by the federal agency to restrict ammunition supplies. Instead of a formal explanation, the federal agency released a glib statement to the media because the amount of ammunition purchased was not abnormal, that the bullets were brought, bought in bulk because it's cheaper for the agency and that the rounds were for training purposes only. Does anybody listening to me believe that the government finally did something that saved money? Does anybody believe that? They have never, in the history of the United States of America, we've never done anything to save money. No government saves money. They don't know how to. It's like we elect people who don't know how to manage a checkbook. We elect these people, and then they go to Washington, and they don't know how to manage our checkbook either. Nancy Pelosi recently said, we don't have a spending problem in this country. We have a problem paying for it, and that's your fault, America. Wait till she sticks her hand in my bank account. U.S. sends nuclear-capable B-2 bombers to South Korea and show of force. We had a visitor last week. Uh, we had a delightful Wednesday with her. Um, her name is Sonia. She is. She was, or I kept saying she was from South Korea, and she said, Pastor, we in South Korea, there is no such thing as South Korea. There's Korea, period. And those people up on the north, we don't know them. Uh, but anyway, she was from South Korea. And um, I, I, I said, you know, my impression of Kim Jong-un is, she said, what? I said, he appears to me to be a spoiled little rich kid that's going to get his way, and he pouts and kills people whenever he doesn't. She said, yep, that's him. Um, the, the U.S. military says two nuclear-capable B-2 bombers have completed a training mission in South Korea amid threats from North Korea that include nu nuclear nuclear strikes on Washington and Seoul. The statement Thursday by U.S. forces uh, Korea is an unusual confirmation. It follows an earlier U.S. announcement that the nuclear-capable B-52 bombers participated in ongoing U.S.-South Korean military drills. Those bombers come from the state of Missouri, and Missouri loves company. Um, they came, I think they come out of Grandview, Missouri. So anyway, uh, and Missouri's motto is show me, and we're going to show them. Uh, people, I don't know. I'm not a prognosticator. I don't know what's going to happen, but the news is full right now of North Korea and a possible imminent war with North Korea. It would not surprise me on any given morning if I woke up and found out that South Korea or Japan had been hit with a nuclear weapon because North Korea has them. They have missiles capable of delivering them as far as Japan, as far as South Korea, and as far as any ships we might have in the area, and we just sent a destroyer over there. They do not have the capability to send a missile to the coastline of the uh, continental or juxtapositional United States of America um, yet. But these, this man's crazy. He comes from a crazy line, his grandfather, his father, now him, and you cannot, he may be just saber rattling to show that he's in charge, but he is playing, he's, he's like a two-year-old with a pistol in his hand. He's going to play with it until it goes off, and um, I would say, and, and I, don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if he's in cahoots with Iran, I don't know, but what we don't want is a nuclear war. We don't want that. I don't want to see, in my lifetime, a nuclear bomb going off anywhere. Is it possible that North Korea and Iran are working together and that they have, they may have smuggled a nuclear weapon up from Mexico? Pfft. How hard would that be? I don't know. But there are some things that if you're not watching what's going on in this world and all the people around you think you're crazy, wait till the bomb goes off. And then give them scripture, all right? Uh, Michelle sent me this. Florida mega pastor 
partners with the former CARE chairman to oppose anti-Sharia bill. Joel C. Hunter, senior pastor of the Northland Church in Longwood, Florida, asked Atif Farid, former chairman of CARE Florida, C-A-I-R, to read Hunter's statement opposing SB 58 application of foreign laws in certain cases to the Florida Senate Committee on Governmental Oversight and Accountability. And, and this article goes on. You know, I didn't print the rest of it. My fault. But here we have a Florida pastor in cahoots now with um, the Islamic extremist group in this country. Um, and what? Let's see. Let me make sure I get it right here. I don't want to act stupid. Let's see. To oppose an anti-Sharia bill. So in Florida, there's a bill right now being debated and voted on that will ex that will exclude Sharia law from being used in the state of Florida. And so this stupid megachurch pastor, who is part of the ecumenical movement under the Vatican, see, see, it's just real easy to trace. If it's ecumenical, it's it's the Vatican. They started this in 1963. And, um, but anyway, it, it, don't, well, this is, this would be bad now. This would be bad for the, for the Muslims in the state of Florida. I'm a mega church pastor and I know, and I don't want this. You're a sellout. You're a, you're not a shepherd. You're a hireling. What you're doing is for money and for, uh, and for popularity, you want to get in the paper. So everybody, all the liberal people who don't actually believe the Bible yet want to go to church they're going to come to your church because you've liberalized everything and you're everybody's buddy and you're trying to get the world to like you and that's not how it's supposed to be. Speaking of the world, I announced this Sunday, I'm making an official announcement today that until, until either I buy the company or somebody else who loves the Bible buys the company, I will never again, ever, 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 never, ever, drink another Starbucks product as long as I live. I do. I'm just telling you what I'm what I'm swearing to today. Starbucks CEO to Christian shareholders, buy stock somewhere else. Um let's this uh, at the annual shareholders meeting last week, Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz insulted Christians throughout the country by suggesting they buy stocks in another coffee business if they do not agree with his position on same-sex marriage. It is no surprise that Starbucks supports homosexual marriage. They've been sending liberal messages for years, but this is beyond anything that we have seen from the left or the right. Schultz went as far as to tell shareholders who support Christian values to sell their stock and support other companies, which I'm going to do. According to ChristianNews.net, Tom Strobar, a shareholder, raised a question during a shareholder's meeting about the significant drop in sales after a boycott from the National Organization for Marriage, who was protesting Starbucks' support of homo marriage in Washington State. In the first full quarter of this boycott was announced, our sales and our earnings, shall we say politely, were a bit disappointing. In response, Starbucks CEO said the company's decision to support gay marriage was not an economic one and snidely suggested Strobar and other Christians who support natural marriage take their investment elsewhere. If you feel respectfully that you can get a higher return on the third than the 38% you got last year, it's a free country. You can sell your shares in Starbucks and buy shares in another company. Thank you very much. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I don't have any share in Starbucks other than when I share with them my money, they share with me a cup of coffee. And I and I and I, I can't I'm gonna I can't express this enough. This is a big thing for me. This is a huge huge thing for me. The first time I ever drank a cup of Starbucks coffee, I did so with a big smile on my face. After I drank it and went home, and the closest Starbucks to me is about 20 miles away. I wanted to turn around that night and go back and get another one. And the next morning, I woke up going, I wish I had a Starbucks. I love their coffee. I don't like anybody coffee, anybody else's coffee, as much as I like Starbucks. And I've tried gas station coffee. I've tried McDonald's coffee. I've not tried Dunkin' Donuts because we don't have a Dunkin' Donuts in Festus. But I have tried everybody else's coffee, even my own, and it's not as good as Starbucks. They make an exceptional product. So for me to say I am never, ever, 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 ever 
going to drink another cup of Starbucks coffee as long as this is their policy. My flesh is going, Mike, you don't want to do it. Mike, don't do this. Mike, Mike, think about it. Come on, Mike. Feel, smell the aroma. Remember the feeling of it going down. Remember the taste. Remember the afterthought. Remember all of that. Mike, don't do it. It's just typical of any sin that we say, I'm not going to do this again. Your flesh is going, now, now, come on now, remember that satisfaction, remember that feeling, remember that flavor, remember that smell, remember this, remember that. And so I, I'm going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protest, and then I'm going, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Yeah, I am, I'm going to protest, I'm not going to drink anymore. And, and I said, uh, yeah, d- no, y- yeah, you will, you will. Oh, yeah, you just keep quiet about it, you will. But I'm making it public now. You'll never see me with another cup of Starbucks or one of them, them little drinks they sell in the gas stations, I won't do it. Airports, won't do it. Driving driving up north, I won't do it. Going through the mall, won't do it. Will not do it. I'm done. Uh, let's see here. What else is going on here? There's gun control stuff all over the place. Let me show you this. Uh, let me get rid of these uh, pesky graphics up here. UN passes, I'm going to have to pull my PowerPoint up. I can't, I can't read this. Uh, UN passes sweeping international arms regulation viewed by some as Second Amendment override. Here we go, people. Get ready. United Nations General Assembly on Tuesday signed off on a sweeping first-of-its-kind treaty to regulate the international arms trade, brushing aside worries from U.S. gun rights advocates that the pact could lead to a national firearms registry and disrupt the American gun market. The long-debated U.N. arms trade treaty uh, requires countries to regulate and control the export of weaponry such as battle tanks, combat vehicles, and aircraft and attack helicopters, as well as parts and ammunition for such weapons. It also provides that signatories will not violate arms embargoes, international treaties regarding illicit trafficking or sell weaponry to a country for genocide, crimes against humanity, or other war crimes. And it's a setup. It is an absolute setup. For it, it, it's an in run gun control measure, is what it is. They can't get it passed in the Congress, they can't get it passed any other way. So now they're going to run around it and use, use uh, some semblance of a United Nations treaty, which, according to our Constitution, treaties are binding. Treaties actually override the Constitution of the United States. This is how it probably is going to be done. Here is another article. I mean, a Drudge Report was all over this today. Connecticut proposals on guns or other items after Newtown. Uh, let me get to the next one here because they kind of go together. Connecticut lawmakers reached deal on gun control legislation. Connecticut state lawmakers came to an agreement Monday on what they said will be some of the nation's toughest gun control laws. The deal included a ban on high-capacity ammunition magazines such as the one that was used in the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre in Newtown. The deal also calls for a new registry for existing high-capacity magazines and background checks that would apply to private gun sales. Here is, and, and we saw this coming. This was the reason why uh, um, I think Newtown happened. And, if you, and I don't really care about all the conspiracy theories about one or two gunmen, about the guy in the woods, is Adam, was Adam Lanza real? Did he really exist? And all of this stuff. I've seen, I've seen some of the craziest YouTube videos in the world. One guy posted video of police cars and stuff like that in front of the Sandy Hook Elementary School that were videotaped by a, by a helicopter, posted it, and put on there that that was from the day before the shooting because it took place at sunrise. And trying to make up this conspiracy theory that the government people were already there at the school the day before it happened. And I'm going, well, that's, that's stupid. Because that looks like video to me of the day after it happened. And so they try to concoct these stories. When you believe in the Bible, you don't need everybody's conspiracy theory to work. You don't need it. 
What you need to do is just read and study the Bible, and you understand that there is a spiritual basis to disarming human beings, both physically and spiritually. Did Adam Lanza have a spirit? You betcha, as they say up in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah, you betcha. He had a spirit. And it dawned on me, I'm watching this, and I told my wife, here they come. They're going to come after our weapons. And sure enough, Barack Hussein, the next day out there talking about, we need, we need measures, we need laws, and Joe Biden cursing everybody under his breath and all this stuff going on, and now they're doing it. They're doing exactly what we all feared they were going to do. They're doing it. And what it's doing, here's, a, here's another one. California lawmakers consider, uh, consider regulating taxing ammunition. Gun control advocates in Sacramento are putting a new twist on an old NRA slogan, guns don't kill people, bullets kill people. Democratic lawmakers, Democratic lawmakers, the people who are for killing babies, the baby killers of America party is for killing babies and against innocent citizens from defending themselves. This is what they're for. Well, my granddad was a Democrat and my dad was a Democrat. Now I'm a Democrat. Democratic lawyers are pushing like never before to regulate or tax ammunition sales. They say the logic is simple. A firearm is nothing but an expensive paperweight without ammunition. And they're right. And this is why Reg Kelly is opening up his own company to manufacture and sell ammunition. Um, we regulated gun sales because of our concern about safety. So by logical extension, we should do so with bullets, said State Assembly woman Nancy Skinner, Democrat from Berkeley, whose uh, bill will be heard Tuesday by the Assembly Public Safety Committee. Democrats and sellout Republicans selling out America, selling out the Constitution, chipping away at it one piece at a time. Democrats propose $10,000 fine for gun owners who don't have insurance. Georgetown passes law. I, I like this one. Georgia town passes law requiring res residents to own guns. I think I'll move to Georgia. I think I will. Or, or let's see here. How about this one? Free gun programs plans to expand to North Texas. I knew you Texans had some amount of sense in you. Sunny Acres neighborhood, an area that has worked hard to keep crime out, but it has been a struggle. Last July, Dallas police suited up in riot gear and tried to control an angry mob right behind Carter's home. Officers were called to the area for what turned out to be a setup between rivalry gangs over drug turf. It ended up with one man being fatally shot by a Dallas officer, but a new program is getting Carter's attention. The Armed Citizen Project is raising money to give free guns to residents living in high crime areas and to single women so they can defend themselves against criminals. Amen. Based in Houston, the group now wants to expand to Dallas. Sounds good, but you have to be careful, said Carter. It's good to be able to have weapons in case something happens to you and your family. When you're not there, that weapon could save them. And if, you, uh, if you've if you watched our God, Guns, and Liberty video and the conference that we had with Pastor Reg, you understand where we're coming from on this. They disarm us physically because they've already disarmed us spiritually. They've taken away our Bibles, taken them out of the schoolhouses, the courthouses, and now the church houses. So the American citizen has been disarmed spiritually, and now he's just going to take whatever his government gives him and be disarmed physically as well. And they both go hand in hand, and the Bible's very clear on that. I will probably, I've been praying about what to talk about uh, down in Arkansas, down in the Ozarks. But I think I'll just talk about God, guns, and liberty while I'm down there. Let me teach you something. Let me teach you something from the Bible. In fact, let's, let's tie the two together, all right? Take your Bibles, 
Um, the ones that have these and thous in it, that's the one you need. Turn to Ephesians 6. Let's tie, let's tie some things together here. The haters are going to hate, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I appreciate all the the emails and the letters and the cards and everything that people send saying, Pastor Mike, stand strong now. Keep going. Uh, that's up to the Lord. I will. I want to. And But it'll be up to the Lord what he wants me to do, and I'll just do what he says and and give him all the praise for it. And so you tell God thank you, all right? But we are in a battle, and we're going to be. We're it's going to it's going to get heated up here. Um, and the purpose of a watchman is to be watching and to warn in advance, so that you'll know that it's coming. Um, had a good conversation with a fellow yesterday, and um, he's got a situation he wants people to pray about, and just to let you know. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to say what it was because um, I don't have permission to. But um, God knows who it was, and so if you'll just pray, God bless that fellow that Pastor Mike talked to yesterday. But he's got a, he's got a situation coming up, and and he's kind of a, uh, afraid of it because he's going to have to stand some ground, and he's kind of concerned about the backlash. And he's, he made the statement. He said, I know that, you know, I, we're not supposed to have any fear and we're supposed to be this and that and the other. And I said, uh, let me tell you what I know. I said, God will use fear to provoke us um, to, to, to go to him. David said, what time I am afraid. And I don't remember exactly. Well, somebody looked that up and you'll find it. Uh, what time I am afraid, I think is exactly what he said. Pull up my King James Pure Bible search software. Donna tells me that she's working on another version of it, and she said it's going to be awesome. What time? There we go. Uh, it's in the Psalms. Psalm 56, 3, what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. And use fear to bring you to the cross. It was fear of going, he going to hell that brought me to the cross. It's the fear of, of eternal punishment that brings you to salvation. It's when we are surrounded, when we are up against the Red Sea, and God is the one who went and got Pharaoh and drug him over there. And the children of Israel, what, they're, according to the charismatic movement, they're not supposed to be afraid. They're supposed to be empowered. And they just claim in Jesus' name that the waters will, will, will part. If you go read that story, the Israelites actually complained. On the day that Pharaoh came and they were backed up against the Red Sea, they actually complained to God. Doesn't sound like they had a, a lot of faith at all. And yet God parted the sea anyway. You know why? Because he loves his people and he keeps his promises. That's why. Anyway, let's get into it, all right? Um, Ephesians chapter 6. If we find ourselves in fear... There are things that we can do to protect and defend ourselves. So when it comes to arming yourself, uh, you all know this, and I'm just going to kind of put it together with something I'm going to show you. I actually, the, the mark of the beast, the Hebrew Roots Movement is leading you there. They are. Trust me. And I'm going to use their stuff to prove it. Um, but anyway, put on the whole armor of God, he, Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You are told to stand, to stand firm, to withstand, to stand fast. Don't move. Don't be shaken. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Let's count. Now, I've, I've done this before. Principalities powers, rulers of darkness, of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. The four things that we fight against, the four kingdoms, the four forces that you and I fight against daily. These are the spirits that are at work right now who are going to bring forth another Jesus. This is actually from 
uh, you're getting a preview of what's coming out on Sunday. This information that I'm going to share with you came to me yesterday. Today's Tuesday. Yeah, yesterday. Because just yesterday, I finally finished the script for Another Jesus. And I'm looking at this, and I'm just going, this is one of those <gasps> moments. So we have the four. We have four beasts rising up out of the sea. Where do you find out what the sea is? Where do you find out? It's in the Bible. Okay? It's pretty cool. You have the four beasts rising up out of the sea. The fourth beast is diverse. He's dreadful and terrible. He's not of this world. He's different than the other three. So it's not the revived Roman Empire with uh, Nikolai Carpathia as its head. It's not. Anyway, it's um, the fourth kingdom, Daniel chapter 2. That's what these all entail. So he said in verse 13, in order to effectively fight these people off, you have to have weapons. You have to use them or else they will destroy you. The whole purpose of every cult in the world that names itself after Christianity, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Roman Catholicism, Hebrew Roots Movement, Seventh-day Adventism, and, all, and the charismatic word faith, the emergent church, all of them, liberal, liberal theologies moving into what used to be conservative churches in order to make a buck off of them. You have to be able to, you have to be able to arm yourself and use those weapons or you will fall like the rest of them. They are falling and you're going to go down with them. You, you will not be able to withstand in the evil day. And there is an evil day coming, and you will fall like the rest of them if you are not equipped with the right gospel, the right spirit, and the right Jesus. So wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. You'll be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the plain of Dura when everybody else has fallen. Because you were equipped. They had, they had armed themselves likewise. They had armed themselves with the mind of Christ there in that plain. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, we believe our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your idol. We're not stupid. We know who the real God is, and that's not him. And we're not doing it. Kill us if you want. We would rather die free than live to be your slaves in bondage to your fake God. Purpose this in your mind, everybody. Get this in your heart. Wrap that around your heart as your, as your idea. Just like the American patriots of old, live free or die. And I would rather die a free man than live under the, the tyrannical rule of a false God that cannot speak, hear, Save me, use his arms, use his legs, nothing. So he said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, feet shod in preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, um, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always. Seven things here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know what that means? Don't just defend yourself. Help defend the weaker saints. Don't just think of yourself. We're all in this together. This is why you guys pray for me. This is why I pray for you. Because we're all in this together. So we arm ourselves. We have a weapon. The sword of the word of God. And it's the only way. The Bible and Bible verses are the only only way to stabilize yourself and your position when people come at you with well Jesus was a Hebrew and he would have said this well don't you understand that Jesus mother and Joseph and all of his brethren and sisters and all the disciples were were Hebrews and they would have called him Yeshua okay yeah so what so what what does that mean does that mean that I have to call him that because that's what they called him? No. 
because I am not told in my Bible to call him that. I'm not knocking you if you do. But I will, I will tell you this, and I, I'm just going to be dead honest with you. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to make it like I'm coming out against you because you have said you refer to him as Yahshua, and, and you do that as kind of a, well, you know, that's kind of what everybody called him. And I just want to ask you a, a simple question. Why do you do that? Do you feel like that you are doing something that Jesus will regard higher than those of us who call him Jesus. And I, I'm just asking what your motives are. Because when I hear the argument, well, his mother did, his father did, uh, his brothers did, and his daddy died young, working in a coal mine. It, all these people, when you say, well, that's what they called him, then why are you calling him that? And it seems to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that you have this idea in your mind that he will hear you more or you will be more well favored by Yeshua when you call him Yeshua, as opposed to those who call him Jesus. That's the only thing that I can see why you would do that. The only other reason when someone blesses me in the name of Yeshua, or when I hear them see, see something on Facebook they, where they say Yeshua this and Yeshua that, the only other thing that I can think of is that you are walking in the direction of Hebrew roots, sacred name, theology. And I'm going to try to stop you from doing it. I'm going to try to stop you from doing it, if you'll let me. Because I've taken a look down this road. I know where it's going. I get it now. I, I'm going to fill myself with more information. But as far as the end game, I got it. And you've been set up. You have been set up to believe something that's not true. It's not biblical. And so I just, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I love you, and I want you to love me back for telling you something that's true. And I'm I'm not giving you anything but scripture. My scripture tells me that I call him Jesus and that's what I call him. And again, I don't think it's a sin for you to say Yeshua. I'm just asking why you do. And if you believe that it curries more favor on you by Jesus, when you call him that over those who call him Jesus, that is unscriptural and your, and your motives are wrong. The Bible said, blessed are the pure in heart. Exa what are your motives? That's all I'm asking you to do is examine, judge yourself. Judge yourself and ask the question, why am I calling him this when my Bible that I believe every word of, when my Bible doesn't say it, doesn't have it in there? Why do I call him this? I just, I want you to ask yourself and be honest. You can lie to yourself. I've done it. I've lied to myself. I just want you to be honest. Now, the reason why I brought up the, uh, the weapons and the four. So I want you to remember this number four. And I'm going to show you. So this is uh, from the, this is from, this is a preview now. You remember Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl was... I used to call him the dead God. I don't call it that anymore. I call it what, I, what I've been reading, and that is the dying God. And let me, explain, let me explain to you what I mean by that. The dying God is the God who is perpetually dying over and 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 over again. He's not just dead. He is perpetually dying. So what are you talking about? Mankind as a whole is perpetually dying. Every minute, I don't know how many people in this world every minute die. Maybe if you, uh, somebody on Skype or the Facebook group, give me a number. You're going to Google it. How many people die per minute? Every minute, people are dying all over this world. And every human being has what the devil put into Eve, his words, his words of death, and they were passed on to us. 
and every time a human being dies, that God, that no good thing that Paul said was in his flesh, just keeps dying. And so you study the myths, it's just type in dying God. You'll see Osiris, Bacchus, Dionysus, uh, Myth Mithras, who is Mithrandir in the Lord of the Rings, and all of these others. He's the dying God. So Quetzalcoatl was the, um, the Mexican version of this. He is the serpent god, the fiery flying serpent. And according to their legend, he was crucified and he is dying on an X-shaped figure, like a cross. Well, we all know what that is. That is the earth, air, fire, and water. That's the elements. And I want you to notice something about earth, air, fire, and water. Earth, air, fire, and water are opposites. Notice on the left hand, you have on um, uh, uh, the left hand top of the screen, you have fire. And uh, on the right lower part of the screen, you have water. Notice that the triangle points up and the triangle points down. They're opposites. And then obverse from that, you have up on the upper right, you have air, and it's pointing up. And then you have earth pointing down. They, too, are opposites. Okay? They're opposites. What do they represent? Here's what they represent. They represent the four base pairs that are opposites. Guanine and cytosine are opposites. That would be um, earth and air, let's say. Fire and water would be adenine and thiamine. So the four here in this particular case, or the, let's see this cross here that Quetzalcoatl is dying on is none other than your chromosomes, where your DNA is, your X chromosome. That's the four things, earth, air, fire, and water, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine. Now I want you to notice that Quetzalcoatl is the dying god who is on the cross. Here is this emblem here. This is actually from a book called The Crucifix that spoke to St. Francis. Are you getting where I'm going here? The miracle that is ascribed to St. Francis is that he went into a Catholic chapel to pray, and when he got in there, a crucifix, now I want you to get this, the crucifix is an idol shepherd, I-D-O-L shepherd, and it's an image of the beast that the false prophet causes to speak, Revelation 13. Because when St. Francis of the Sissy got into this chapel, this idol shepherd, that's the dying God on the cross, the God of the sacrifice of the mass who is perpetually being sacrificed, on a cross for your sins. The idol shepherd, the statue, the image of the beast, spoke to St. Francis of Assisi and told him that the church was in uh, disrepair, that it was all broken down and he needed to fix it. So now we have the New World Pope. And the New World Pope deliberately he has a right to choose his name no other pope number one was a jesuit number two no other pope was from the new world number three no other pope ever referred to themselves as pope francis after saint francis whose sole legacy is that the dying god on the x chromosome the idol shepherd spoke to him just like in Revelation 13. Wow. Now here's where I'm going with this. This is this is big. All right. This is very, very large, big. I want this image here of the dying God is the image is is an image of the beast. And it's seen every, and there's just more than one image of the dying God, like Quetzalcoatl, that has to do with a cross or a cross-shaped idea. Uh, Albert Pike, if I were to run out here and get my copy of it, and I showed it in the video, 
Albert Pike wrote a whole section in Morals and Dogma on this on the symbol of the cross in its various forms, whether it's the swastika or the towel, okay, like this, um, or the the letter X or any other of those symbols. The swastika, of course, Adolf Hitler used because he believed in the evolution of mankind that man was going to become gods, and that's why he used that symbol. It's the same idea. And I'm going to I'm going to give you this too before I move on. I'm going to get into the Hebrew roots thing here in a minute. You're going to your jaw is going to drop off of your face when you see what I'm going to show you. But I want you to follow me on this and I explain it more in detail in the video. The dying god that that exists in every human that little piece of the dying god, he cannot be resurrected because he's perpetually dying. Every time a human being dies, he dies with it. But then there's more human beings, and they keep dying and keep dying. And so here, here's the thing. The dying God, which is the Antichrist, another Jesus, can only be resurrected if everybody stops dying. What did the serpent promise Eve in the garden? You shall not surely die, but you shall be as gods who don't die. Gods are immortal. What did Ray Kurzweil promise? Time Magazine, 2045, the year that man becomes immortal. He no longer dies. We're looking at genetic ways. We're looking at technology, te technological ways. Altering man's DNA somehow, some way, we're trying to teach ourselves, and I believe, I believe spirits are involved in indoctrinating and teaching the minds of these physicists and these biologists. Francis Crick admitted, Francis Crick admitted that he was using small amounts of LSD so that he could visualize and imagine what the double helix of DNA looked like. Where was he where was he getting his inspiration from? The spirits. So I believe that the physicists, the biologists, the people who are working on the large uh, Haldron Collider, the looking for the Higgs boson, I still I don't quite understand that, but anyway, but I do know that they have a statue of the beast sitting out in front of their building. There's a statue of Shiva with its eight arms sitting out there, or is it is it three, six arms and two? I don't know. Anyway, Shiva's the beast, the dying god who wants to be resurrected. Some for somehow, some way, the Higgs boson has something to do with that. These scientists are being inspired by principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness. They have familiar spirits telling them, giving them the inspirations of what they're supposed to be doing. Why? Because the end game is to keep every human being alive on the planet long enough for the beast to be resurrected. This is what I see from the scriptures. Is there a place in scriptures that actually says that there will be a time when no human being will die. Go find it. Revelation 9. The fifth trumpet sounds. The scorpions come out. They sting mankind. And for five months, man wants to die and can't. Nobody dies for five months. Do you know what the gestation period of a goat is? It's the same amount as the gestation period of a sheep. And in Matthew 25, Jesus comes to do one thing. Separate the sheep from the Baphomet goats. Just like the wheat and the tares. They're going to bind up the tares, 
and separate them out from the wheat. And the tares, they get burned in the fire. Do you know how long the gestation period of goats and sheep is? Five months. Now, take a good look at this, all right? Take a good, good look at that. That is the dying God in your chromosome. Um, we just went through the Catholic thing of Lent for 46 days. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get the whole 46-day thing with Lent and them putting an ash X on your forehead as a mark? That's the reference to the dying God in your DNA. Now get ready for this one. A few months ago, when I first tore into the Hebrew Root Sacred Name Movement, it's because Jim Staley called here and provoked me. He called here, and I'm not returning his call. I'm not going to talk to the man. Don't have to. I'm going to warn against him. I'm going to warn against him and everybody else who's trying to drag you under the law. But he provoked me, and I went to study further what he said, if you remember that. And I mentioned here the fact that Staley and 119 Ministries and Rude and Monte Judah and all these other guys, their whole print, one of their one of the foundations of their religion is that they, they keep saying Jesus would have spoken Hebrew. The disciples would have spoken Hebrew. They would have written it in Hebrew. They would have Hebrew this and they would have Hebrewed that. The problem exists for them is that there is no evidence that any of it was Hebrew. And so what we have is that the entire record of the New Testament is in Greek. Well, they say that's because the Hebrew works were destroyed by the, by the pagan Greeks who wanted to alter the doctrines. And so I brought up the question, if Jesus was all about being a Hebrew and wanted everybody to be a Hebrew, and if we're to be grafted in on the vine of the Hebrew, why then did Jesus identify himself in Revelation 1, not as the Aleph Tav, the first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, but as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet? Why did he do that? I am the Alpha and the Omega. You know what he was doing? He was telling the Gentiles, I'm your Savior. I said to my people, I would not speak Hebrew to them anymore. With stammering lips and another tongue, will I speak to this people? And God meant what he said. He wasn't going to speak Hebrew anymore. So he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. A while later, 119 Ministries... I don't know if they heard what I said or not. I don't know. But all of a sudden now they come out with a new, got a new revelation here. Got a new revelation from God. And it's real funny. And I, I wrote down what he said so I wouldn't get it wrong. So I couldn't be accused of, well, you I never said that. Well, yeah, I wrote it down. You said it. He said uh, that the speaker of 119 Ministries said that um, Jesus was a Hebrew and John was a Hebrew. So what Jesus would have said, that, that statement just cracks me up. It makes me laugh every time. I just want to go, <laughs> what he would have said. That sounds like a kid who got caught saying a cuss word, and then he's in front of his mom and dad going, I, I didn't, I didn't, what, what I would have said was, this is what it sounds like. So they're saying what Jesus would have said. Had it been preserved, he would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. But that's not what it says in our Bible. It's not what it says in the Greek Bible. It's not what it says in the English Bible. It's not what it says. That's not even what it says in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's what he said. No, 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 no. He, he really would have said, he was saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav. 
And so they put out a video called The Mystery of the Aleph Tav. It's, it's God, Jesus, Yeshua's signature, bringing you back under the Torah, telling you, you got to keep the Torah. Got to be like the Hebrews. Got to be like the Jewish rabbis. So I saw this. Uh, there's a book out there. Somebody actually in an email recommended it to me. And uh, I, I, to, to the person who recommended it, I'm not trying to be mean here. Uh, there is no way in the world that I'm going to endorse that book. It's called the Hebrew Yeshua versus, versus now the Greek Jesus. Versus the Greek Jesus. You can, you can understand where that's going without reading it. But they promote the idea of the Aleph and the Tav that Jesus is rather than the Alpha and the Omega. Now, here's what's significant about this. You remember when I was talking about Staley and his doctrine, and I was reading from, um, I, I still have it somewhere in here, in notes somewhere. I was reading from Staley's article that he wrote out of his own mouth about, uh, and that's not it. I've got it in here somewhere. Here he is. Staley's article, What is the Real Name of God? And in this article, he talks about how the Hebrew letters all have their own meaning. Uh, the Hebrew language is an ancient language that first started in pictograph form, meaning that originally the words were pictures that eventually evolved into letters. And so in Hebrew thought, a name is not merely a random combination of sounds created for arbitrary designation. But the, the, the teaching is that since each individual Hebrew letter is a picture of something, that when you see a name in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, you don't just read the name and that's what it means. It has a secret hidden meaning based upon what the Hebrew letters look like. And I actually, I'm going to show you what I did. And it just kind of came to me. Okay. I've said, I'm going to show you now in the Bible where it's talked about that the Hebrew letters have a definition. And I went, doesn't exist in the authoritative guidebook that God has given a record to all mankind did you know that there's not one word in 1189 chapters 929 chapters of the Old Testament there's not a word in there about Hebrew letters having a picture symbolic meaning not once even in Psalm 119 which we know was inspired by God, and each segment of Psalm 119 in verses of 8, each segment begins with the alphabetical Hebrew letter, Aleph, Beth, Daleth, Gimel, and so on, all the way down to Tav. There are 22 sections in Psalm 119. And did you know that you can read that 48 times in a row and never find out that the Hebrew letters were pictographs and they had their own secret meaning? Even in the book of Lamentations, in the original Hebrew, the book of Lamentations has uh, five chapters. The first chapter has 22 verses, and the beginning of every verse in Hebrew, the beginning word of every verse in chapter 1, the first letter of the first verse starts out with Aleph. The first letter of the second verse is Beth. The third letter is Daleth, and then Gimel, and so on. And then in chapter 3 of Lamentations, you have, you have it in segments of three. The first three verses, the first letter starts out with A. The next three verses starts out with Beth, and then so on. So there's 66 verses in chapter 3, and then it goes back to 22 and 22 in, verses, in chapters 4 and 5. And if you read those, not one word, not even a clue, that the Hebrew letters themselves have a hidden meaning behind them. It's not there. Where did that come from? Who designed that? Who made that up? Let me show you something. You know Joseph Prince, that uh, Japanese guy that uh, has a deep voice and he talks about all the great things that God is showing him. He's even fallen for this. He has fallen for, if he wasn't fallen already, 
He's fallen for the Aleph Tav Jesus doctrine. And he's got a book called Aleph Tav Jesus. Um, uh, I can't even read it. Something in the Bible. His signature in the Bible. I want you to look at that picture next to that, the Aleph Tav. This is by Brad Scott. What does that look like to you? What does that look like to you? I'm going to show you what they said. This is, I'm telling you, it's a setup, everybody. It's a setup. You fell for this, and you were set up. You see, they call the Aleph Tav God's mark. And here's what it says. The ancient Hebrew pictograph for the letter Aleph is an ox head. Are you kidding me? And they say, that's God. The ox, the bull, the golden calf, the beast. That's who their God is, according to their pictograph. The ancient Hebrew pictograph for the letter Aleph is an ox head, meaning God. As in, the Lord is my strength. The pictograph for the letter Tav is two cross sticks, meaning a mark or a covenant. Therefore, when Jesus says... I am the Aleph and the Tav, which he did not say. He did not say that. Therefore, when Jesus says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, what he is really, what he would have been saying is, he is the mark of God. An ox in a chromosome. I'm telling you, you fall for this stuff, shame on you. You have, you ha I won't tell you what you've done. You've carved out an image of God and or Jesus that does not match the image drawn out for you in the pages of the scriptures. You let the Staley's and the Rudes and the Montejudas and the Rabbi Messers, and you've let all of these people in 119 Ministries, you have let these people carve out a different, another Jesus for you that you like because now it's all about I can do, I can do these things, I'm going to do, 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 do. And doing is boasting. And I tell you, I have, n I have not encountered a humble Hebrew Roots Movement person. Not encountered one. The ones that I've encountered are very arrogant and very cocky. Because the scripture says, not of works, lest any man should boast. <sighs> Boy, you ought to hear the boasting come out of them. Well, we kept the Passover. What did you do? Have your little pagan Easter service where you ate a piece of bread and drank the cup? Is that what you did, you little pagans? We kept the Passover, really? The more I look into the... And somebody sent me a book, and I really appreciate it. I, I, it's laying on my desk. I haven't had time to read my regular mail. But I noticed today that somebody sent in a book that was a, a listing of what's in the, the Jewish Passover service. And I, I've kind of looked at that, and I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of things that the Jews are doing every year at Passover, and the Hebrew Roots people, they're not in the Bible. Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Um, I'm not going to back down from the Hebrew Roots, the sacred name, I'm going, to, I'm going to do everything that I can and use as much scripture and scriptural understanding as possible 
to destroy that doctrine, just like Paul did. And these guys, whew, they hate Paul. Oh, my goodness. They hate him. You know why? Because he called them out for what they are. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Who beguiled you to believe that God's mark was a symbol of a bull, an ox, in your chromosomes? And I know I'm. that's not what Paul said. Who hath bewitched you? Who did that? Well, let's see what you think of me. Nico says, the book, the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. I notice the letters H-A-G-S are larger than the rest. <laughs> know what hags are? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, Danny says, I was listening to your 328.13 broadcast. You hit a pet peeve of mine. When Nebuchadnezzar speaks of the fourth man in the fire, he says the fourth is like the Son of God. It doesn't say it is Jesus, but like Jesus. Big difference in my book. This leads me to another like. When Jesus is praying in the garden, his sweat is as great drops of blood. Yet, uh, yet you hear, I think we need to be, uh, yet we, you hear people say he sweated blood. We had tears of blood. No, it is as blood, not is blood. I think we need to be aware of these similes and quote them as such. Anyway, that's my rant. I hope you enjoyed it. Um. Danny, I'll be honest with you. I mean, you make a you make a good illustration, but I I hope that you're not saying, and maybe I'm just reading you wrong. I know that just a few sentences I can have a misunderstanding. But if you're saying that that was not Jesus and the Son of God in the fiery furnace, you're dead wrong. Okay, you're you're just dead wrong. I hope you're not saying that. So anyway. Um, Barb says the Skype say you have to save or republish this teaching. Really? Okay. Well, it'll end up being a, tr it's going to come out in the, uh, another Jesus and all of those, all the Watchmen video broadcasts are transcripted. And then as time allows, we turn them into books. So yeah, I guess so. All right. Um, let's see here. Thank you. Um, a fellow writes in and says, 107 deaths per minute. That sounds about right. Sounds about right. Uh, let's see here. Emma, you would love Canada's Tim Hortons coffee, eh? Pastor Mike, eh? I think there are a few Tim Hortons in the States, eh? I'm not sure where they are, though, eh? Loving your work as always. God bless, eh? I appreciate that, Emma. Appreciate that. Tim Hortons, huh? You say it's you say it's as good as Starbucks. You say that. Now if I if I have some of it and it's not, I'm gonna cry. Okay. Uh and yeah, Jared makes a good point, not to mention that the Queen of Heaven, Babylon the Great, is their icon. Yeah, oh yeah. Astaroth, oh yeah, I get it. Okay. And, and it's just one of those things that, you know, we're in the world and we and not of the world. And we look at that and we're going, well, I don't think I'm really drinking the goddess here, so I'll keep doing it. But then after a while, it just clicks and the symbol goes along with their doctrine and you go, mm, yep. I mean, I don't purposely recuse myself from a business or something like simply because their logo, I can understand their logo and it has uh, secret diabolical teachings behind it. I don't. I can't do that because practically every company out there is changing their logo to some occult new age meaning that I know what it is, like Dairy Queen and Sam's Club and, and all these others. B but when I see the spirit of that coming out in the company's uh, ideology and, and what they're backing and so on, I finally have to say, I'm done. Okay, I'm done. Uh, John writes in and says, uh, hey, Pastor Mike, the passage that first came to mind was in Revelation 9 about those that would want to die but could not. 
This connects to Genesis 7, where at the time of the flood, all were killed and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days or five months. That's exactly right. The opposite of that is none will die, according, connecting Genesis 7 to Revelation 9. This is a connection that both my wife and I made as soon as you started talking about not dying. You got it. Good job. Good job. You know, And you know what? All you did, John, all you and your wife did, you just started thinking Scripture. Thinking Bible verses, thinking putting this and that, that here a little and there a little. None shall want her mate. All of that stuff that the Bible's teaching us how to do, that's what you're doing. You're just connecting Scripture. And then you go tell somebody, like some other preacher or something like that, and they're going, well, I think you're just listening to a bunch of stuff. Okay? They don't, they don't get it. You know why? Because that's not how they study. You know how they study? They click around on the Internet until they find the sermon that they want that would sound good, something would be easy for them. They download it, then they go play golf or look at Playboys or whatever it is that they do on their off time when they should be studying the Word of God. That's what they do. Uh, let's see here. Hello, Mike. Need to ask a big favor. This is Paul. Could you put a list? Not the Apostle. Could you put a list together of all the numbers and their meanings, definitions, somewhere online? This will help our studies along with the KJV Bible Code studies. Please uh, get a copy of By Divine Order. And you know what? We, we need to come up with some way of uh, putting our, making our books available as PDFs so you can download them. Uh, and I'll tell you, it'll cost us a lot less money if you'll download them and print them out yourself. All right? But... I mean, we, we, try to, we try to make them look nice, okay? See that shiny thing on there? That's put on there by hand, okay? We order a huge roll of this, of this 0.2 mil or 2 mil laminating sticky stuff, and we take these covers and print them out on cardstock, and then, and, and, and Gary does it. I come in yesterday, Taylor, the flute player, she's out of school right now. So she was in there, and I saw her. She looked in there. She was laying, she was laying the covers down on the, uh, on, the la on the laminating film, and then we roll them through a press. I mean, we do all that by hand. And um, so, I mean, we try to make them look nice. It costs us for the color printing and all that good stuff. So um, maybe somebody could come up with a good suggestion how we could host these online for little or nothing, and people could download the PDFs. But there, in, in the book, By Divine Order, and in the King James Code, I, I list what all these numbers mean. All right? So maybe we'll have that uh, shortly. Uh, Michelle says, there is a horrible echo which makes it impossible to listen. Uh, I don't know of anybody else. That, that does happen from time to time, but I think it's on the receiving end and not on the sending end. All right. Henry, how you doing? I think I know who you are. Are you uh, friends with Michael down in Florida? Anyway, hi, Pastor Mike. Greetings from Nederland, the Netherlands. Keep up the good work. We love you. Appreciate that. Sean. As Christians, we have been somewhat conditioned to believe that the Antichrist will look like a man as opposed to the Bible's description, seven heads, etc. My question is, if a man appears on the scene who has all of the characteristics of the Antichrist, brings false priests to use it, brings false peace to Israel, stop right here. Stop right here. Let's open her up. Daniel chapter 9. Okay? Uh, Sean, open your Bible. Okay, I have a I have a question. It's not a I'm not knocking you. Okay, this is this is a nice guy question. Okay. Would you be able to prove to me? And I believe that according to scripture, uh well I can't say that. The book of Daniel's sealed. Okay. Where is Daniel? It's before Joel, isn't it? There it is. Daniel chapter nine. If you were in court, would you be able to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the Antichrist is going to sign a seven-year peace agreement with Israel? I mean, that's what you're saying. Seven heads, uh, he brings false peace to Israel, lying signs and wonders. That and I agree with. Mark of the Beast, I agree with that one. Abomination of desolation, got it. False prophet and arrest. It does not fit the physical description from the Bible. What should we then believe as Christians? Here's what I'm telling you, Sean. This is the gist of why I'm doing the another Jesus idea. Is that the King James Bible is telling us everything that we need to know. We may not understand it yet, but I promise you, 
I promise you, when it's time, I believe Second Thessalonians 2, I believe that day shall not come, talking about our gathering together unto him. That's what it plainly says. That day shall not come except the calling of come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. I absolutely believe that we're going to see this guy and we're going to know from the scriptures that it's not Jesus. But here's my point, and I uh, see that I'm about out of time here, but I'm going to ask you a question again, uh, Sean. And again, it's not adversarial or anything. Would you be able to prove from the King James Bible in a court of law that the Antichrist is going to sign a seven-year peace agreement with, with Israel? Could you prove that from the King James Bible? Okay. Well, Daniel 9 says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, that's what it says. I believe it. But I am, I am a doubter until I see it plainly in Scripture. And I've been taught all my life that the Antichrist is going to sign a seven-year peace agreement with Israel, then he's going to break it halfway through and blah, blah, blah. And that's the basis for the seven-year tribulation. If you believe that, and, 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 and I would be honest with you, the whole either pre-, mid-, or post-tribulational idea is based almost solely on the idea that the they say the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace agreement with Israel and then breaks it three and a half years into it. My question is, why doesn't it say that here? It does not. It does not say seven years. It does not say peace agreement. It it, it doesn't even identify. I don't know that it really properly identifies who he is because in the previous verse it's talking about two different he's. Number one, the Messiah. Number two, the people of the prince that shall come. So who is he? Who is he that confirms the covenant with many for one week? And then in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Who is the he? What does he do when he confirms the covenant? Not a covenant, the covenant. And how long is a week? So would you be able to prove in a court of law that the Antichrist is going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with Israel? So, and, and when you ask me, are you pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? I don't know that the word trib applies. I don't know that it does. Because it seems to me that it's primarily based upon somebody's reading of, of Daniel 9, and that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, which they say, of course, that's seven years. Everybody knows that's seven years. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say it. So I'm questioning that. I am. I'm questioning whether that's right or not. And I can't teach it until I know it. Ball's in your court, Sean. Okay? I hope you play well. I like a good game. I don't, I don't get into arguments and things like that, but I do like to provoke thought in people. All right? All right, I love you. See you in church tomorrow night. You better be there. Bible study, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Looking forward to it. And uh, we'll have a Bible study out tomorrow. The Watchman video broadcast of the Jesus will be next Sunday. We are leaving on Thor's Day and will return on Saturn's Day night. So please don't send 5,000 emails between now and then all right just kind of hold back on it we'll be back next week i love you i really do i had fun today hope you did god bless you don't take the ox mark on your forehead whatever you do don't do that okay 